I um, heard the tail end of your talk, Martin, and also enjoyed the, the video with Kath. Um, what good, good people and very inspiring. And it's my pleasure to be here today. Bill's a gentleman, so I'm going first. Um, I am a general practitioner. Um, I've been working in Wellington and I've been um, a GP now for 29 years. I'm also a mum to five boys and one girl, and um, I'm also um, keen to help out wherever I can for these sorts of causes. Now, I support the New Zealand Medical Association and World Medical Association in upholding the ethical ground which underpins our practice. I do not believe that euthanasia and assisted suicide can be ethical behaviour for GPs. They are not medical treatments, and doctors should uh, not be used to sanitise state-enabled suicide. And a lot of doctors think that it should be, uh, if you're going to do it, then you, you appoint you know, people who will do that specially. We do not want a bar of it. Um, the key thing is that one day you and I will be sick and vulnerable as we discover what it is that is going to bring about our end. This comes to everybody. We will need to know that our doctors and nurses and society are united in being supportive of us as we become less useful and more expensive in terms of assistance needs and financial costs of care. Uh, Canada's now had legalised euthanasia for just on three years. They've costed it out. They've figured out that, it's some, that, that the, the state um, will save somewhere between 35 to $139 million through having euthanasia. Uh, the fact that you've even gone that far is very, very worrying in terms of health policy. Now, most importantly, as a GP and listening to my colleagues, I have seen firsthand my patients' concern about being a burden. I have witnessed that not all families are supportive, willing, or able to provide emotional and practical support. And it's my uh, strong opinion that legal, legally sanctioning assisted suicide and euthanasia will tip the balance of presumption by a patient of they're going to look after me and they're going to help me to one where they'll be worried about what we're going to do. That situation already exists in Canada, a country thought to be similar to us, where you've got patients who are terrified of what their doctors are giving them in case it's precipitating things they don't want. And you've also got um, patients who very much want euthanasia and are worried that the pain relief that the uh, palliative care specialists want to give them are actually going to rob them of the capacity to make the decision that they legally have to make. And so they're suffering more and for longer because they no longer trust the palliative care specialists. What a mess. If you have doubts about this, then you can go and the web on the website of Age Concern and read about the escalating elder abuse that's going on. So the current law and medical services are protective for both the patient and the doctor, and families. After these 29 years of practice, I can say that I've never had any family member say to me that they wished their sick relative had gone and taken their own life, or that they wished that I had ended that patient's life. I also had the privilege of working for six years in a decile one school in Porirua, in Wellington, mainly with Pacifica and Māori students. Uh, mental health was a very big part of the job for the young people. To me, it's a bizarre contradiction to contrast years of doing this sort of work, um, trying to prevent another suicide statistic, with these moves in law which expect doctors to assist with or directly carry out the suicide of those who are sick and terminally ill. And I continue to deal with young people with depression and anxiety and sometimes just bad impulse control. Um, in my experience, the majority of them do have an overwhelming despair and inability to cope. And at the same time, 
it can swing very quickly from despair to things are okay. If someone's gone and euthanized you on the way down or when you're at the bottom, there's no coming back up, there's no bounce in that one. Uh, and people can and do commit suicide if they are absolutely determined to. New Zealand's high suicide rates attest to this. We have some of the highest in the world and they are twice the, um, the road toll. And think how much effort goes into trying to bring that down the road toll. You can't turn on the TV for five minutes without seeing one of the ads. It is both inconsistent and cynical to legally signal that suicide is good for the old or sick people, but bad for young and distressed people. You get mixed messages, and, the, um, and, and people try and say, no, 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 the, the older white middle class educated people baying for euthanasia at the moment are making a rational choice. It's rational suicide, that's okay. And that's, these, that's different to what the young people will do. Um, when Quebec legalised euthanasia, and they did that before the whole of Canada, um, they actually had, there was a problem in the EDs because doctors were not resuscitating young people brought in um, who'd taken overdoses. Why? Because they said, well, they've clearly exercised their right and autonomy to, to, um, to die. And, you know, so what's the point of resuscitating them? That was a bit of a bad look. So there was a, um, a problem with that and, and the, you know, some action was taken to, to put that right. Um, I'm sure that was um, probably more, a, you know, probably more because uh, there were groups in the wider parts of Canada who didn't want that bad press overshadowing what the, the law was doing and what the lawyers and judges were doing about changing the rules for everybody. Look, a more consistent position for the medical profession and for society is the position that gives hope and meaning for both the young and the old. I've been told by one of my sons, I don't do fa Facebook, that, oh, you know, there's a bit of a meme about you, Mum, because you were quoted when I presented to the... Um, the Parliamentary Select Committee, um, saying that um, if, assist, if assisted suicide is a triumph for autonomy and choice, how can youth suicide be a tragedy? <laughs> so people have got really upset about it. The activists have got really upset because at the end of the day, in people's heart of hearts, they think, well, actually, there is a connection. You've got people who want to die. They absolutely do want to die for whatever reason. They're, they're both suffering. And, you know, what will happen if we say it's okay for those older or sick people, but, you know, we still have to spend all this money and effort and time on young people? So I, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so where we need to be in is a situation where death with dignity is the respect and care expressed in a palliative care setting, not this, this you know, medically sanitised suicide scenario. Sadly, that can and won't happen. I've looked at what's been happening in, in Canada, and it's very, very difficult. The euthanasia budget, now, sorry, the um, palliative care budget has now been renamed end-of-life care budget, and that budget now has to include all the activity around euthanasia. So the cake itself, um, referencing cakes again, thank you, Kath, has not got bigger. It's just that there's a, a, a decent hunk cut out of it for end of for euthanasia. So that puts a lot of stress on the doctors. A lot of the doctors who were roped into doing it found that actually they were experiencing what they call existential or metaphysical distress. You know, we're totally programmed to care and to comfort, and, and sometimes you get the bonus of a cure, quite often. But this is something else. This is actually about directly killing patients, and that does get to doctors, even ones who think that they'll be okay with this. In Quebec, the numbers of doctors signing up for palliative care has dropped significantly. They are in the gun, and doctors are quite conformist. You know, unlike the, the legal 
people and people who go into p politics, lobbying, they like the argy-bargy, they like a bit of confrontation. Doctors like to, you know, have this sort of quiet conformism. We like to sort of get to the problem and just be quietly behind the scenes. We're not activists. So, um, you know, that, that poses a problem. Um, it poses a problem, for example, for Roger Foley, who is a 45-year-old um, Canadian with a severe neuromuscular degenerative disease because, like many of the disabled, he wants assisted living, not assisted dying. He wants to be able to have some control over what health care he gets, and he wants it to be in his home. He was sick of the crap carer who wouldn't turn up, um, the, the, the poor food that saw him food poisoned more than once, and he wanted to actually get out of hospital and be able to go home with decent care. What did he get offered? Assisted suicide. Lots of discussions about assisted suicide. That was not on his agenda. Where was his autonomy and choice? So he made complaints. Fortunately for him, he had the common sense to tape, and um, that's now going before the courts. And I think he's got a very good point. Our own Health and Dis Disability Commissioner has said that this bill sends a clear message to the disabled, your lives are not worth living. I was at the, um, the, the second vote on, on the euthanasia up in the gallery, in the speaker's gallery. It's a special part. It's more special than the other parts of the gallery. And in there, for the first time in my 30 years of going in and out of the gallery, I saw not one, not just one, but four women in wheelchairs, and they were young women. Two of them were holding hands. And when politicians in their speech started to talk about their experience of death, and it was clearly that they had been suffering, and, and from the story that I heard that really caused the upset for these two women, I got the impression that the, the relative wouldn't have called for euthanasia. Um, and when, it, when that got to the bit about how this MP's father could no longer walk and move, and that was a very significant thing, and, he couldn't, and that was just terribly hard for, to expect your father to go on with that. And these women are in wheelchairs and they have to be carried to be transferred. Um, there's no walking or much mobilisation for them. I saw them flinch. And I just thought, oh my goodness, you know, all this discussion, all the, the, the sort of the things that you trot out as to why these people's lives are not worth living are things that they strive to live with and deal with every day. When we got the, the result, which, um, you know, was a, one of those sort of heart sink moments where you think, well, we lost that battle. My fight, my, my, my determination about not losing the war really came from the comment that the youngest woman, Kylie, made to me. She just said, well, Mary, if this is law, I will have to get up in the morning and every day I will have to commit to being here because a lot of days are bad for me. And I know that if this law is there, that it will weaken my resolve. So if I don't make that commitment, like a hand on heart thing, I could just, you know, on a bad day, just say that's it. She said, I know that I'm a burden for my family. I don't think of it like that because they don't want me to think of it like that. They don't see me as a burden, they tell me they love me, but I feel guilty. And with this law change, the guilt will multiply. You know, these are people whose lives, you know, sometimes I think I'm having bad days, you sometimes think you're having bad days. These people are, are people whose lives are a struggle, they are heroic, and we will just, will Parliament and parliamentarians have it in their power with their one little vote to either multiply that suffering up enormously, um, and they can say all they like how it doesn't pertain to the disabled and they'll take out those disabled illnesses from the legislation. It doesn't matter, because what it does is it changes society's attitudes. What are you still doing here? Gosh, it's really expensive. You know, that, could, that money could be spent on other really worthy things. And these people know it and you can't hide it. So I don't think we should need to be any part of that. Um, I'm very inspired by my colleagues 
um, especially the doctors in the New Zealand Health Professionals Alliance. I want to um, acknowledge Dr. Ate Moala, who is here with me, a partner in crime. Um, we've already stood up on freedom of conscience rights when our medical council tried to enforce guidelines on us that would have really got us. Because David Seymour will say, well, you guys aren't going to be expected to push the syringe and you know, hook it up and do any of that, so you're fine. We're not fine. We will be compelled and coerced to do the referrals, to put our patients on that little treadmill to death. And we don't want to do that, and we won't do it. How they will get us is that the Medical Council will set up the guidelines. There will be complaints, like what Kath's had. You get those people, who, the activists, who will get out to catch you out. And in Canada, doctors wake up afraid of whether a patient's going to come and get them today, because that has happened. Uh, and these are really good, caring, excellent doctors, so the, the injustice is enormous. Um, but, you know, so that's how they do it. To get the complaint, you get up before the disciplinary com committee. And if we're lucky, we might get a little list like the Canadian doctors have now of, well, you, if you can't do it, you shouldn't be there. So my son came in the other day and I was going, hmm, double inguinal hernia repairs, appearance medicine, um, what was the other one? Oh, a bit of travel medicine. They, they, they was, that was one of the 15 options that if we can't do the job, then we might want to just quietly go or consider signing up for that. Um, so I just want to leave you with um, those comments and hand over to my husband. Uh, but for inspiration and for a bit of a pick-me-up off the floor, I went and watched the movie again, Amazing Grace, about William Wilberforce and what he did to overcome the law of slavery. And I think of the quote that he had, and because I think that's our role. I love the um, talk about let's have real salt, not desalted salt. We have decaffeinated caffeine. Let's, let's, get, sick of, let's get rid of the desalted salt. Um, he basically said, they may choose to turn away, they may choose to turn away, but they can never again say they did not know. Thank you. Well, first, can I acknowledge Mary? <laughs> what's hers is hers, and what's mine's hers, <laughs> as Bob said. Uh, but also to thank her for the uh, inspiration every day. You know, uh, politicians and former politicians have theories. People like Mary actually do the job with people who are experiencing despair and pain and looking for healing. Uh, and that is why the 1,175 doctors who've signed up a letter, Doctors Say No, uh, can be so influential in this debate. I can also acknowledge Bob uh, and the work that Family First does and uh, quite a number of MPs here uh, who all voted against the bill. The argument for euthanasia is often couched uh, as a matter of choice and we've both been part of debates where we've been asked the question, as have others who oppose euthanasia, why we want to take this choice from people. But if it really was just a matter of individual choice, we wouldn't be having a long parliamentary and legislative process, would we? You can choose to fill your car up at the petrol station. You don't need a law change for that. Uh, you can choose to commit suicide. We don't need a law change for that. So why, in some respects, we've got to sit back to think of how big a step this would be for our country. Why are we trying to change the law? What is the law that we're trying to change? And at its heart, it's very simple. We are providing in Parliament for the first time ever an exemption to the ban on killing. That is actually what the law change is. The rest of it's administrative detail. We're, that's why it's a debate. So it's not a matter of individual choice. It's a matter of 
the law for everyone. And the law for everyone we've always been able to rely on is that killing is a crime. If that law passes, we are going to be providing a licence for a particular designated group of people to kill some others uh, without the scrutiny that has always applied to taking the life of another person. And you know, even the proponents of this law know that that's dangerous. And I remember saying that to David Seymour. I said, David, you know this is dangerous. He looked surprised. Well, the reason I can tell that is because he talks endlessly about safeguards, as do all the proponents of euthanasia. So here's the simple question. What is it you think you're safeguarding against, even the, even the proponents of euthanasia? Well, this is where we agree with them. There's a danger that people who do not want to die will be killed with the approval of the state and the community. That's what we're guarding against. Uh, and of course we should be we're absolutely right to try and stop that happening because the record everywhere and anywhere is that when someone is when in a community people are given the right to take lives uh, the appetite for it becomes a terrible thing it grows and it grows because of the logical progression from defining that this particular life around these rules can be taken to the next step, which is, well, why not the next person who almost meets the criteria? And, you know, I thought of that when I was listening to some of the speeches and public comments I've heard and debates. Uh, a whole lot of people have the experience, for instance, of dealing with the challenge of dementia with their parents or uh, their older relatives. And it's challenging. It's difficult. It might be di difficult for them, who knows, with their state of mind and advanced dementia. Uh, it's certainly difficult for everybody else. And we wouldn't normally choose to want to go through that process and, you know, when people hear this debate about euthanasia, a lot of them assume that that's the kind of thing that is going to be able to be dealt with. Well, this law, even the one that's proposed, is wise enough to exclude that group because we know how dangerous it would be to be able to say someone can decide that that person should be killed. Well, the problem is, once you pass this law, New Zealand will inevitably face that question. And the answers to that, as we've seen in Canada, are not particularly pretty. You know, in Canada, the biggest children's hospital has just put out guidelines for uh, what they call... What is it, minors? Mature minors. Uh, euthanasia of mature minors. 14-year-olds, down to 12-year-olds. Uh, they've started their first discussions on organ donor euthanasia because if you kill the person, the organs are in much better shape than if you let them die. Well, this, it's under active discussion, and you can. this is the seduction of the logical progression. Because, And why am I talking about this? Because in the next few months, you're going to hear a lot about Parliament narrowing down the law to try and make it acceptable. Uh, that's what you'll hear. But that is what I'd call a foot in the door strategy. They just want to get something over the line. Because what could be more seductive than the argument for the people that Mary was talking about when they say, I'm a burden, and someone comes to them and says, Well, look. 
not only can you relieve your family or your community of your burden, you could save some other lives. And the person who's not sure would say, yeah, actually, it's a good idea. I can donate my corneas and my heart and my lungs. You know, you can just feel the seductiveness of it, can't you? Just in a couple of sentences. And how dangerous is that going to be? That people who are already feeling like they've taken too much are then presented with the opportunity to give back. You know, the mature minor, the 15 or 16 year old, the 22 year old, the 32 year old, how easy would it be to persuade them to let us kill them in the greater interest? And so it goes on. So that logical progression uh, is so seductive and it doesn't matter how small the first step is, all the others will follow. You know, I spoke to a doctor who's senior in the euthanasia system in Holland. He told me he's reviewed 4,000 cases himself. And he said, the reason I'm talking to you is because this has ended up in a place we never thought it would. And this is someone who's promoted it for 20 years and is experiencing deep doubt about the steps they took that have ended up where they are in Holland, where if you're tired of life, well, doesn't that sound like a wet Tuesday morning for about half the population? <laughs> They're tired of life. So we will continue uh, to oppose uh, this piece of legislation and work hard to stop it. The second reading, um, six, well, net, eight MPs actually moved from being against, to, uh, from being for it to being against it. Uh, two moved the other way, which is very disappointing. Uh, so the gap is smaller than it was, but it's still too big. But we have the opportunity to impress on our politicians. This isn't a small step. This isn't just some nice little thing for a few people. They have to write a law for the 98% who in there facing their death do not want to be killed under any circumstances. And here's a question that I've heard Mary put. How many unintended deaths are we willing to tolerate to allow some choices? And you know what the answer is? None. Because if we, as soon as we say it could be some, well, whose is it? So if there's any possibility that a person will have their life, their life wrongfully taken, uh, in every other respect in our society, we, try, we work very hard to stop that happening. And I think that basic sense of New Zealanders' decency about protecting the vulnerable uh, is starting to just get to be part of this debate. People are taking it seriously and not just seeing it as some matter of choice for a handful of people, are starting to understand this has broad implications for our whole community. And that is why we will continue to work hard, hope with the assistance of Bob and his team, uh, to oppose this legislation and stop it happening. Thank you.